Welcome to another Work From Home series with VM Blog. Today I have with us uh, Paul Vallier, who is the CEO of Tehama. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit about the company? Sure. Uh, Tehama is a company that was founded just last year, but with the technology that was spun out of another parent company, which was called Pythian. And what our uh, product does, what our platform does, is essentially what we call a service delivery platform. It is a purpose-built platform designed to exchange work over the internet. So essentially, if you have a workforce and you'd like to take delivery of that workforce's productivity natively over the internet, that's what our platform is designed to do. And as we're here today to talk about you know, work from home, I wanted to ask you, how has the uh, pandemic changed the way companies are dealing with their workers? And I guess, uh, what are you hearing from customers? You know, were they caught by surprise or were your customers already putting solutions in place for things like business continuity? For sure, a lot of larger enterprises were caught by surprise. Um, the uh, data center edge device uh, capacity to handle an entire workforce working from home was just simply not available for a lot of larger enterprise. Um, some of them were able to just quickly upgrade their VPN licenses with software, but anyone who needed hardware also found that there was just no hardware available on the market for a matter of months. It's only loosening up now, uh, which means that a lot of companies that had uh, remote workforces like technology companies like us were perfectly fine, but a lot of larger enterprises were really struggling to get 100% productivity from their teams. Um, there was a lot of issues as well uh, in terms of workforce management because uh, leaders that had never uh, managed remote workforces uh, suddenly needed to really upskill. And then there's a lot of tooling required to successfully manage a remote workforce uh, as well. I'm thinking of productivity and task management and messaging and meeting solutions like this one. Uh, and so a lot of companies were caught flat footed, but I will say this, um, the urgency with which we all needed to get to this new normal has created, I think, the most rapid digital transformation across the industry in, in all of history. You know, for the companies that are continuing to start to migrate over to a work from home model, um, what would you say in general is, you know, how has it affected the people, the connectivity, and the infrastructure? Well, the... Um, the infrastructure, as I was saying, was really groaning under that uh, workload. And so uh, enterprises that did select VPN-like solutions uh, have also had a lot of challenges around uh, the endpoint device uh, security posture in particular. So what you're seeing is a lot of companies that had issued their own uh, laptops that were company managed, uh, their, their employees suddenly going home and then being unable to connect because of VPN capacity issues. You're seeing enterprises adapt to that by saying, okay, People with the, whose last names start with the letters A to F, please log in between 9 and 11 a.m. I'm not joking. This is a real thing in larger enterprise uh, with uh, capacity problems. Um, you're also seeing uh, similar things in uh, virtual desktop infrastructure. So physical virtual desktop infrastructure that lived behind the firewall or behind the VPN. Uh, those VPN deployments uh, were under extreme duress because now the VPN needs to handle the entire remote display of a machine uh, in a physical data center. So those are the kinds of uh, problems that enterprises have had to deal with. Um, I will say that a lot of those enterprises are uh, also uh, uh, choosing technologies like ours, where the uh, cloud desktop lives in a virtual room in the cloud, and the virtual room connects to uh, the customer's network infrastructure through a zero trust gateway, uh, this permits them to, as I was saying, a very rapid digital transformation could also achieve a very rapid zero trust access transformation because the reality is that there are novel security concerns attached to uh, this very rapid deployment of work from home. So bring your own device morphed into bring your own PC uh, because enterprises hated owning laptops pre-COVID and they hate owning laptops a lot more now. Um, and so, you know, historically, uh, VPN has done an adequate job, but they were used so infrequently they didn't have the capacity. Uh, but also the reality is that uh, VPN also is a, a surface area for, for risk. And so it exposes the customer to malware and other endpoint vulnerabilities and it permits uh, east-west network traffic and resource discovery and all kinds of other problems that you really don't want uh, your team working from home to handle. And so these are the kinds of things that we're seeing uh, across the industry right now as a result of the very rapid deployment of uh, work from home technologies. 
and I know a lot of viewers are, are you know, are watching this series trying to figure out, you know, ways uh, that their organizations can better handle this whole work from home shift. Um, you know, can you maybe talk a little bit about how your, your uh, technology uh, specifically enables the whole work from home paradigm? Sure. So what we do is we create what we call rooms. So if you think of a, we're trying to build something like akin to an internet for work. If you think of the foundational building block of the internet, it would be the router. If you think of the foundational building block of Tehama, it's something that we call a room. A room acts like an airlock for data. It permits the workers to come in, but it doesn't permit any data to escape. And then it acts like a, essentially uh, inside a room, you can instantiate as many desktops as you want and empower as many users to enter into your network as you want. And then using our gateway technology, you can connect that room to the only the specific network assets inside your secure perimeter, whether that secure perimeter is on the cloud or in a legacy data center, doesn't matter to us at all. And so what it does is it permits you to host virtual desktops in these secure perimeters outside your network in the cloud and then grant access to that on a room by room basis to your network assets. So this particular approach uh, permits you to commit to connect remote workers with mission critical and data sensitive systems. So this is our, our world is highly available, highly mission critical uh, data environments. And it lets you do that with uh, unparalleled uh, speed and agility uh, and security and a comprehensive audit trail and real-time uh, activity feeds to feed to your security and incident event management system, and session observability, which is something that is unique to Tehama. So that's essentially what we do. It's a purpose-built platform where an enterprise can build dozens of these rooms uh, in various geographies, uh, in ver for various use cases, Possibly, for, for example, uh, this might be a room that you permit your uh, third party to manage your SAP deployment with, or this might be a room that you enable your call center with, or this might be a room that you've built in Ireland uh, or in Frankfurt for GDPR compliance purposes to make sure that the data doesn't escape Europe. So there's all kinds of uh, reasons that you might want to teleport a workforce from one place to another, and we permit that, uh, including into uh, private data centers. And Paul, what are some of the uh, big questions that your customers are asking as they're moving to work from home? And you know, how are you answering that? So a lot of larger enterprise customers have capacity on their minds because they're struggling to find enough laptops or, to, or waiting a long time for laptops to be delivered. So if you think of a larger enterprise with uh, 10,000 users, for example, they're used to buying about 2,500 laptops a year. That's just, that's just how long a laptop lasts and they're rolling them uh, every year. And uh, they're interested in, do we have the capacity to onboard uh, 2,500 users? Um, fortunately, we're born in the cloud and, and a cloud native platform. So that sort of elasticity is built into our platform. And, you know, we're happy to say that we can just take it on. A lot of enterprise customers are very concerned about compliance. Uh, they're used to buying hardware and software and running it on their own premises and taking responsibility for its security posture and for its compliance posture. And when cont contemplating uh, adopting a SaaS platform that directly permits and brokers access to their data assets, they're worried, like, is this going to be more secure than us? And so we uh, answer a lot of compliance-related questions. We are old hands in that world. Uh, the platform has its SOC 2 Type 2. It has, uh, was built inside a SOC 2 Type 2 uh, compliance bubble. Um, and then uh, the compliance is also supported with uh, per room policy controls. So we have really good answers to these questions, but those are the ones that come to mind uh, in the larger enterprise world about adopting a platform like ours. And you kind of touched on some of the security uh, issues, but specifically, I guess, with companies who are migrating or have already migrated workers from the office to the home, uh, are there any kind of security challenges that they should be uh, really keeping top of mind and thinking about that they may not have noticed before when everyone was working in the office? For sure. Um, working from home leaves employees vulnerable to uh, cyber predators, essentially. And you can attack uh, users with weak passwords. You can get them to uh, broker access to their sensitive information. Uh, the, the machine itself uh, that, you're that you're delivering to your user, you don't really know what is, what is happening on it when, you're not, uh, when, the, when your user is not connected to it. So it's the possibility of malware being installed on it by a teenage uh, son or daughter in the evenings is, is there. And that's a new concern 
Um, and so ultimately all these uh, attacks are coupled with phishing attacks and social engineering attacks lets you uh, see that, that corporate data is basically vulnerable. Um, the reason is, this is new is because people tend to rely, re rely on contextual clues of authenticity and legitimacy. And so you're used to recognizing your colleague because you know them and you work with them every day and you see them in the lunchroom every day or you see their work badge or you see them call from an internal extension. Uh, Working from home deprives your team of the majority of these contextual signs of legitimacy, and it really amplifies the risk of these kinds of attacks, and we're seeing them happen in the industry right now. Um, the other thing that is worth pointing out is when an employee leaves the company, it can be very difficult and painful to collect and repurpose their equipment. This is especially a concern in, uh, like right now we're in summer student season, so onboarding summer students for four months when that means you know, enabling, let's imagine you have 100 summer students, it means finding 100 laptops, imaging them properly, shipping to 100 different homes, and then trying to recollect those 100 at the end of the year. Or you can also imagine uh, Airbnb with 1900 layoffs, uh, the pain of trying to recollect that equipment and then having a purpose for that equipment at a time but that is, uh, you know, it's a time of shrinkage. So those are the kinds of things that are uh, really on the security and operations managers minds right now. And obviously, uh, that's part of the appeal of virtualizing that entire life cycle of owning the machine and deprovisioning the machine, which is something that Tehima does. What would you say is some of the key technologies that um, people should be using as they're making this shift to work from home? I would say that um, the remote work ecosystem is on, built on a foundation of a virtual desktop. So an orchestration and security platform like Tehama is a good example, but there are others like uh, Microsoft WVD, for example, is a, is a uh, or Citrix Cloud. These are uh, typical virtual desktop uh, technologies. On top of that, you then need to run a suite of tooling in order to keep your workforce productive. And they have to do with creating digital analogs for all of the things that we used to do uh, physically. So that includes uh, storage, so no more physical filing cabinets, but we use Box or we use Dropbox or we use Google Drive. Um, uh, task management, we may no longer use like a whiteboard knowing who is uh, responsible to do what, but we might be using uh, Monday.com or Reich or other uh, tooling. Um, I'm thinking of messaging. So for example, uh, you can't walk up to somebody as easily, but you certainly can send them a note on Slack or Microsoft Teams or those kinds of messaging tooling. And then of course there's meeting solutions, like the one that we're using right now. So Google Meet, uh, or again, uh, uh, the Skype for Business or any of these kinds of tools where you can create, uh, or Zoom, where you can create a meeting. And then uh, the other, uh, there are edge cases as well. So one of the edge cases that comes to mind is you know, we used to rely on physical signatures and obviously Adobe Echo Sign or DocuSign type solutions are uh, very valuable remote working solutions that have increased in uh, prominence over the course of the last few months. All of that tooling is built on the foundation of a governed desktop that has permission to access those data assets. And that's where Tehama comes in. So all of those tooling is, is typical tooling that an enterprise would deploy on top of our platform. And as an industry expert, do you have any tips uh, for organizations uh, that what they could be doing better now to better prepare for some future event that could cause another work from home shift? Well, one of the things that I think it would be a, a tragic for any enterprise to miss the opportunity is to realize that soon their workforces will be permitted to come back into the office, but it will be gradual and it, their offices may not have the same capacity that they had pre-COVID. So I think the most important thing is to take stock of what has been working better in your enterprise these past few months. And for every business, there are some things. I know in our business, there are many things that are working much better. Um, I would say that uh, finding a path towards running digital by default, and then instead of treating your uh, permission to work from home as a perk and your office as the foundation of your business, I think we need to switch to your digital workplace as the foundation of your business and the office as a perk. And to miss that opportunity would be a tragedy for any enterprise that is looking at uh, uh, this, this transition period of moving back to the office. And the reason is simple. Um, your team in the office is going to create, if, unless you enable them to be digital first, they're going to create a disconnect between your office-based team and your home-based team, which we don't have now that we're all outside of the office. 
Uh, I would say that other tips that I would uh, mention are very, very important is keep your security, especially securing the human training fresh. It's extremely important right now, and the transition period is going to include that. Uh, verify all of the policies uh, to make sure that you have clarity because communication is key. People want to do the right thing, but it's really important to keep them trained and up to date on what the right thing is. Uh, business continuity planning is not going away. I call for uh, refreshes for remote work business continuity plans in February, and I'm not sure a lot of enterprises uh, reacted to that call, but those that did were much better prepared, and it is clearly has a huge payoff. Um, and I would say another tip that I think is important is if you want to explore what these digital first practices would look like, uh, you should uh, register for our month-long conference that runs in July. Uh, it's a free community event. It covers all aspects of remote work, including culture and talent, security and operations, business management, and, and, uh, so, uh, and uh, so on. And uh, we have a huge lineup of thought leaders that are sending two content sessions a day all month long, and it's called the Digital by Default Summit. I would love for any, uh, as many of your audience that would like to attend to come. Now, we kind of talked about the future, and you know, obviously a lot of people are going to want to continue to stay working at home uh, in their shorts and not having the commute and all those good things that come along with it. Um, for businesses, how do you get people to come back to the office? after they've been working remotely. And is there a cost savings for having them, you know, maybe keep half of their, their uh, workforce at home? There is uh, no question in my mind that the new normal will not look like the old normal. I'm hoping it's a digital first new normal because of the tragedy of, of failing to stay in this new world uh, would represent. But this digital first new normal presents new business strategies, much like you're telegraphing. And I think that those are uh, going to be an important dynamic over the course of our next 10 years. I'm a remote work entrepreneur since 1997. So I've been predicting this future for as, as long as you can possibly imagine. But the reality is that I, I sometimes wake up and feel like we're living in 2030. That's how fast the changes have been. Uh, you see Facebook, Twitter, and Shopify uh, having announced permanent work from home uh, policies. Uh, this is impossible for every business but uh, and every workload in any given business, but it is possible. And if you are digital by default, you have unbelievable access to talent opportunities. Like why would you want, why would you prefer just rationally, if somebody's going to be working from home anyway, why would you prefer to employ them in New York city rather than Allentown, right? Uh, Allentown, same time zone, same accent. Right? It's just literally, uh, there's literally no possible reason that you could uh, prefer uh, someone in Manhattan and paying that kind of rent. And so what that means is that we can, we can aspire and hope that these remote workplaces can help us heal the rural urban divide, help us reinvigorate our small towns uh, as enterprises do the rational thing, which is look for the best talent at any given price point. And, um, and that talent is going to find uh, happy homes outside these overheated real estate markets like uh, New York City and San Francisco. And so uh, I believe that that is a, a phenomenal path to opportunity for talent and path to talent for enterprises. And I, I'm very excited about the future that that uh, brings. Uh, I just want to point out, not every worker wants to work from home. So one of the cool things that's happening right now is our offices have about half the capacity they had pre-COVID. But the good news is half of our teammates don't want to come back. <laughs> so we have the capacity for almost everybody that wants to come back right now. Um, but there is, a, there is a huge contingent of our workforces that prefers to work in the office, that relies heavily on the social dynamics of the office to feel connected to their colleagues, to feel emotionally connected to their workload, to feel emotionally connected to the enterprise's mission. And, um, and for those people, they'll be delighted to come back to the office. So I predict this kind of a hybrid team dynamic to, to persist for quite a long time. And a lot remains to be seen, but that's my prediction. Well, Paul, I definitely uh, appreciate your time and your expertise sharing that with our audience today. Uh, I wanted to, before we let you go, find out where can folks watching learn more about uh, your technology? I know we talked about the summit and uh, we'll be sure to... Uh, Put a link so folks can you know find more uh, information specifically about that but what about I, technology and 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 do you have any resources 
uh, maybe on your website that people can download that specifically talks about work from home? Oh, for sure. Um, I am a huge believer in the power of uh, contributing to the community uh, as a mechanism of building credibility and brand. So it's like a very generous form of marketing, but it really resonates with the culture we're trying to build in the business. So on tehema.io, you will find a blog with enormous resources, uh, along with uh, white papers and eBooks and webinars galore. Uh, there, is a, there are a lot of valuable resources there on tehema.io. Um, but I think that another really important thing to point out is that this Digital by Default Summit is also a love letter to the remote work community. It is a community-oriented event. It is a non-commercial event. No money is changing hands. The sponsors just help us reach our audience, that's all. And um, I really encourage the community to congregate and uh, get, get involved in the event. There are going to be phenomenal networking events. And I, also, I, I firmly believe that uh, meeting peers and thought leaders that are dealing with or have dealt with the same problems that you're dealing with is an incredible accelerant to doing things right the first time. So I really believe that attending these kinds of events is very valuable as well. Well, great. Well, the summit sounds great. We'll do our part to try to get people to, to register, get out there and watch and see what's, uh, what you guys are showcasing. Great. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see more of these VM blog videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. And it's important if you want to get notified the next time we post a video, please hit the subscribe and the bell notification.